Thank you, dear Consul General Osher. Thank you, Professor Small, for two very eloquent uh, introductions. I am very honored and humbled to be here in this massive institution of learning. Uh, being that I dropped out of university myself, much to the dismay of my father, something that, even though my book is not about that, it's indefinitely, or it's always on a topic of our conversations. So he's, of course, smiling on the other side of the North American continent and the, trans and the, and the Atlantic Ocean that I'm actually at a university. That's a triumph, <laughs> you know. But he did say before I embarked on my journey to the United States 10 days ago that, you know, well, if you're going to be in America talking about your book, you're going to be talking to people who are very well versed, well educated, well spoken. You know, you might want to think about going to university. You know, it's not too late. <laughs> you don't want to make a fool of yourself, you know, talking to educated people. And so I have a few minutes that were put aside for me to read a bit from my book, but I thought I'd do something a little bit different because I have lived on my life on stage, my professional life on stage for the past 30 years. So inevitably, after spending about 18 months writing the book, I really wanted to get back to the stage. So I turned the book into a stage performance. So monologue, narrative that segues into music and then goes back into storytelling and segues into music. And did that in Sweden, premiering in 2017, and did it for three seasons in Sweden, uh, all around the country. Now, not only do I have the immense, you know, good fortune to have my book published in not only the United States, but in all English-speaking uh, uh, territories, I asked the publishers, American, it's Amazon, I mean, I'm like, do you really mean all English-speaking territories, Belize, Kenya, you know, what bookshops do we have in Nairobi, and so forth and so on. But just the fact that, that my work is available in English and can now be brought outside of, you know, Sweden and Norway, which is mostly the uh, countries where I work, uh, is just, it's, it's beyond what I can put in words. Uh, I've also had the good fortune to, via a very brave theater company in Harlem, uh, been allowed to put up my stage performance of A Drop of Midnight in Harlem. So that will be opening on March 30th. So, since I'm in the midst of rehearsing this 40-page script and getting all this text into my head, I really need to rehearse. <laughs> you know? And there's no better rehearsal than rehearsing in front of an audience. So the text, of course, for the stage performance are based on the book, but they're kind of reworked to work as spoken word. So I thought instead of reading, if you don't mind, I'll do a few pieces from the stage performance. There'll be no music, but you know, you'll get some idea of what, how I speak, write, and think. So I'll start off with the second scene, which is right at the beginning of, of, uh, of the performance. My grandfather always wore shine shoes. His name was Solomon Warren Robinson, but people called him Silas. And he worked most of his life as a waiter, first on the Pullman trains and later in life at a steakhouse in the village. And Silas didn't miss a day of work. I mean, no cold, no aching joints, no swollen feet, no cold, bad weather, no existential crises could hinder him from fulfilling his duty. Silas was born in the town of Allendale, South Carolina, in 1907, more than 40 years after slavery had been abolished, and more than 10 years after the deconstruction of Reconstruction and Plessy versus Ferguson ushering in the era of Jim Crow. In Grandfather's day, the plantation houses around Allendale still stood fully operational, as monumental reminders that nothing had really changed. And the endless fields of cotton still needed to be harvested each season, and the hands that did the picking were still black. That's what Silas, his grandparents, aunts and uncles did. Pick cotton from sun up to sunset. The only thing I have for my grandfather is a tan trench coat. He must have loved this coat. 
The sun, the rain, and the hard winds have faded into the sand shade of South Carolina shores. Fingers, rings, and cufflinks have worn its shiny sleeve lining almost a threat. And I have to be oh so careful putting it on as to not tear it any further. But when grandfather bought this coat, it was a prize. It was his proof of having finally arrived. I mean, he worked hard for every dollar, nickel, and dime, and what money he had was his minimal savings from minimum wages, from picking cotton to shining shoes to finally waiting on tables. This coat must have been more than important to him, just like his shine shoes. They showed that he was no longer one of the barefoot, rag-clad black bodies working themselves to death on the fields of the South. I can picture grandfather trying to coat on, checking himself out in the shop mirror, feeling a swell of pride in his chest, how it matched his suit, his spats, and his Panama hat. An elegant message to all he breezed by on the boulevards that he was a sophisticated cosmopolitan who's managed to move up in the world, up north, up from the muddy cotton fields, up to the concrete pavements. Harlem. But now in my apartment, in front of the mirror, in Stockholm, I'm wearing grandfather's time-worn trench, wanting it to, wishing it will help me dial into the past. I'm trying to call my ancestor. Then that goes into song, and you know, there's a whole musical number, and then it lands back in text. It's February 2015. My marriage is falling apart. Last month I turned 40. I have zero inspiration and haven't written a song in more than six months. How am I gonna live without music? Music has been more than my job. It's been my identity, my entire existence. The only thing of value that I have to offer. For the past 20 years, music has been my number one priority. I've chosen it over family, friends, and relationships. But this writer's block and this divorce are crystal clear signs that my life is heading down the wrong path. And I have to get out of here. Then I get a message on my phone. Hope we can talk soon. Love, Dad. This means that he's lonely. My father, Matabuko, lives in the city of Malmo neighboring the small town of Lund, where I was born and grew up. Malmo is 400 miles from Stockholm, where I am now. Dad never wanted me to move here. He'd much rather I'd stay close to him in Malmo. But let's just take a quick moment here. What images pop into your mind when you think of Sweden? No, it's not the country that makes watches, chocolate, or cheese. <laughs> and polar bears don't roam in city streets either. And yes, healthcare is as free as the air we're breathing, as free as university degrees even. And parental leave for each child lasts 550 days in the US. And until recent, was the quintessential land of blonde hair and blue eyes. The flat, wind-bitten city of Malmo is home to 300,000 sun-starved souls many of which have fled to this place, displaced by the wars of near memory, the former Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, Somalia, Iraq, Iran, Syria, Libya. Malmo is by far the most diverse city in Sweden, a country so intrinsically white they didn't even acknowledge that racism existed here until the moment ago. Every time I tell Swedes of my experiences with racism, they gasp in disbelief. Really? Here? In Sweden? Yet this place reeks of implicit bias. Now awfully amplified by a powerful political resurgence of white supremacy and racist violence. Screaming at black and brown bodies in Sweden that either you start assimilating or you can't keep migrating, believe it. Listen, even though I'm born in this place, the exit sign never leaves my field of vision. But Dad likes it in Malmo. He calls it the Wild South. He says it reminds him of New York in the 70s. 
For the past couple of weeks, I've been nagging Dad to tell me about my great-great-grandfather, who he was, when he was born, what sort of work he did, how he lived. I tried to get him to share details of our roots. I bombarded him with questions about grandfather and grandmother and, and our family. But Dad doesn't share my enthusiasm about digging around in the past. So I gather my thoughts and summon all my patience before I dial Dad's number. I've also been trying to persuade him that we should go to grandfather's birthplace together, that we should take a trip to our roots. I got a bad heart, Jason. I don't want to go to South Carolina and end up having another heart attack. It hurts me that Dad can't or won't see how complex the question of my identity has been to him. It's like he doesn't understand how hard it's been to maneuver in a world where I've so often neither been black enough to be black or white enough to be white. But Dad catches my silence on the other end of the line and starts over in a more conciliatory frame of mind. But Jason, my son, you have roots. You know who your parents are. And we've always... I cut him off to say, I just want to see where I'm from. Sorry about that, guys. I just want to see where I'm from. See it with my own eyes. But I don't want to see where I'm from. Why can't you understand that? I just want to forget about the poverty and the misery. I don't want to relive all that racism in the South. I really don't want to go to South Carolina. And Jason, why do you keep insisting that we go look for old Negroes graves long since paved into parking lots? Why? I realize that I'm going to have to go on my own. And if you bear with me, I'll do one more scene. This is much further into the to the work where I've actually arrived in South Carolina. <clears throat> in South Carolina. The following day, I'm driving through subtropical forests and ramshackle villages, straight into the heart of South Carolina. I'm looking for sheds of Grandfather Silas. I'm finally on my way to Allendale. This is as far back as I've been able to trace my paternal ancestors. This is as far back as I've been able to trace my paternal ancestors. My forefathers and mothers who arrived naked on these very shores. But from where? What songs were sung in their villages? What gods did they pray to? And I bet they didn't need pig ears either. Not yet. They needed to be enslaved for that to be turned fool. Neither Silas nor any of his children or grandchildren have set foot in Allendale since he left this place in the early 1920s. Maybe they thought the sight of this place would turn them into pillars of salt. I'm hoping the sight of this place will connect me to it all. But my train of thought abruptly derails as I look out the car window and for the first time in my life, see a cotton field. I hit the brakes. It's just an ocean of white clouds. It's like I've stepped out of a time machine. I mean, imagine if it was right here, where I am right now. As carefully as I can, I cross the muddy ditch onto the field, where the cotton sits in a brown, crown-shaped shell, like a flower that has dried out and split open. It's now offering up its white insides. To get a bowl, I have to stick my fingers in a bit and gently tug. It's so soft. At the same time, my fingers are scratched by the husks as I pick tuft after tuft and fill the paper bag under my arm. In grandfather's day, 100 pounds of cotton would bring me about 50 cents. An exceptional picker could do three or four times their weight in a day, but 100 was the gold standard. 100 pounds equals 7,000 clouds like the one I'm holding right now. How could this beautiful, soft plant in the palm of my hand breed such brutal greed? Cotton. What a gift to white, and what hell for black. 
It contributed to the Industrial Revolution of Europe, and cotton picked by my ancestors was spun in the textile mills of Sweden. More than half of the cotton imported to Sweden in the mid-1800s came from here. And slave pig bowls became the frills adorning Swedish kings. But as I rolled the cotton between my fingers into a ball, again I'm connected to a genetic phone call. My ancestors appear before me. My great-great-grandmother, Myla Miller, and her husband, Jack both born enslaved, and their 14 daughters, and their grandchild, Silas. I can see them now gazing out across the field, wiping the sweat from their brow, and hoping that the foreman on horseback won't notice. Can they see me, the fruit of their survival, a branch of their steady tree grown in a land, grown in a faraway land across the sea? born into such privilege and opportunity? Did the hope that I may one day be help them to endure their relentless days hunched over the thigh-high plants, hands and, hands and backs aching from the brutal monotony of picking, and hanging over their heads the ever-present threat of yet another whipping? I can hear their blues. Can you hear me singing? As I step back onto the shoulder of the paved road, I actually land on the shoulder of generations of sacrifice, courage, and resilience. I am my ancestors' wildest dream. They're one in a million. My shoes covered in Carolina mud and my paper bag full of these white clouds, the same clouds that rain the blood of my ancestors. I'm going to put this cotton in a jar and put it on my desk at home to always remind me of what it took to get me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, no, I'm just standing for a moment and then I'm going to sit. Um, I hope at some time to meet your father, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. you got to come back to London. Yeah, I'll, I'll make it there. Thanks for the invitation. I think they'll let me in with the UK passport. I'm not actually you know, sure about Maybe that, I can call you. If you say you live in America, yeah, you'll yeah, be fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I'd like you to deliver a personal message from me to your father and to tell him that Professor Small said his son came here and spoke with confidence, <laughs> sincerity, and a fantastic delivery to more PhDs and would-be PhDs and others than you've ever been within a room in your life. I may be him, but I know less about him. So congratulations. congratulations. I'm willing that Bjork would have caught this on film because this would be actual evidence. They have it on film. They have There's nothing my father respects more well, than, a, than a PhD, somebody with a PhD. <laughs> He has, he has two himself, so it's very two. sad that, I have, that I'm not even on my way to a one. A PhD is, is something, but it's not everything. Some of my best friends have PhDs, let me tell you. I know them. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. You're for welcome, you're welcome. Uh, let me just mention a couple of things I should have mentioned at the start. We'll take 20 minutes and I'll ask Jason a number of questions and try to get him to deliver uh, answers to the questions with the ease and the depth that he just demonstrated he's capable of making look effortless. Okay. Then we'll have 15 minutes for questions. On the program it says that we'll have book signing and then I'll close the event, but we're going to uh, shift that around. Uh, I'm going to thank the audience at the end, then we'll have book signing because I have to go and do my day job at 5 p.m. when I'm teaching a course on globalization. And you can stay with Jason and then I'll see some of you later in the evening. So thank you very much for that introduction. I have a series of questions. Let me get started and we'll see how it goes. Okay. <laughs> Let me begin with one of the most powerful and what I found to be evocative statements in the book. You're talking to Don, um, your father's closest friend, and you say to him, and I quote, or you say in the book, and I quote, when I meet Don's moist eyes, 
I think about how every human, from the time they're born until the time that they die, every human is a universe of memories, dreams, plans, sorrows, desire, and convictions. In listening to Dad's and Don's testimonies and stories about slavery, I am given the opportunity to remember what I never had to suffer through. I am grateful, so fervently grateful, that my gathering tears retreat, and instead, I find I want to break out in the hugest smile that I can." End quote. Now, I think that everyone present here will have a similar universe of memories, dreams, plans, sorrows, desires, and convictions. Let me ask you this. When you conceptualized the book and th first thought about writing the book, did you have a particular audience in mind? Was it a Swedish audience? Was it a world audience? Was it young people, old people? What kind of thoughts did you have? Well, I knew that I would be writing in Swedish because it's definitely the language I feel most at ease and in control and with the healthiest disrespect for, you know? <laughs> Uh, so Swedish is really mine. It's been a point of pride since I was a child that to be able to outspeak, uh, you know, the color, whatever disadvantages the color of my skin would present to me, it has been one of my strategies to really grasp the language of the place where I'm in. Um, having said that, writing the book was deeply personal, you know. I realized it was something that I needed to do. It wasn't something, it was something that grew on me gradually. You know, the seed really had time to kind of gestate under the earth before even a shoot could, you know, show its leaves to the sun. I didn't know. When I started, it was just kind of a, you know, it started with a, me and my father having a cup of coffee and he telling me a story about, I knew that he was from, Harlem, New York, or Harlem, USA, as it's called. He said at one time, in 1965, he had a girlfriend from Harlem, Georgia. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew of Harlem and Holland, but I didn't know that there was a Harlem, Georgia. Mm -hmm. So he tells me the story of how he's driving from Harlem, New York, to Harlem, Georgia, to visit his girlfriend. Now, 1965, he's wearing a pair of church's shoes. So British handmade shoes that cost $50. His father thought this was outrageous. Like, no, the only a fool would pay that type of money for a pair of shoes when you could get a perfectly good pair for $5. My father, of course, in the ever ongoing intergenerational or transgenerational conversation, dismissed his father's words. Anyway, he hops in the car, has to stop in the, on the Lower East Side to pick some things up. While he's there, the, the rear window, a small rear window of the car gets broken, and the car gets broken into. He comes down, is dismayed to see that some of his stuff is missing, but he's like, I'm on my way to Harlem, Georgia, I'm gone. Drives down to the South. Now, as a young black man in a suit, the $50 shoes aside, it's still 1965. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a lethal risk take. You know, it may very well be today. But in, outside of Lexington, South Carolina, he, got, he gets stopped by the state troopers because they want to know about this broken car window. And maybe the fact that the driver is black is catching their interest. Mm -hmm. um, they, he runs into complications with the state troopers. They take him and deliver him to the sheriff. And so my dad's fear is just growing and growing and growing. They deliver him to the sheriff. The sheriff impounds the car, but lets my father go after some twists and turns. So my father is only left with taking the bus to Harlem, Georgia, but the next day, so he has to spend the night in this rural South Carolina town uh, at a motel. And rightfully so, he's scared to death that they might come and lynch him yeah. at night. So ironically, he chooses to climb up into a tree and spends the night in the tree. The same place where, you know, if his foes were to come and look for him, they'd spend. Yeah, yeah. 
and it was something so tragical and comical about picturing my father with these fifty dollar pair of shoes spending to save the night his own life to save his own life. And then he goes on to Harlem, Georgia. So him telling me that was definitely the most interesting cup of coffee I've ever had with my father. So when, when I got back home, I wrote it down. So it was four pages of text. And then I was like, well, let me see what else, you know, I've heard stories all my life, but let me start cataloging some of it. Mm -hmm. So I started, you know, unearthing stuff. And then I started talking to my mother. So it took a good six months of doing this until I could even kind of utter to myself and admit to myself that I was writing a book. And at that point, the first intended reader was me, because I was like, this will be my map of who I am. This, this seemingly easy question that has haunted me, or that I've carried for all of my life, who I am, where do I belong, who are my people, where is my home? Uh, but other than that, I thought, this map could also be an offering to my future children, if I ever have any. I hope I will, but you know. So that was my intended reader other than myself. And just to cut the story a little shorter, I heard a radio program on Swedish national radio by a fantastic Swedish singer of Gambian descent named Sena Bosi. Yeah, we know him. You know, she's amazing, amazing, and a good friend. Anyway, at some point in her radio program, she, she addresses an imaginary uh, young black girl somewhere in Sweden and, tells, and gives her instructions mm -hmm. how to take care of her hair. You know, because this might be a major point of confusion for somebody with, sure. of African descent and growing up somewhere where they don't know how to take care of her hair. I was so moved by this, her talking to this person on, you know, Swedish national radio, that I also decided that, yes, my intended reader is also that lonely, mixed-race kid somewhere in rural Sweden who has these feelings of halfness deep inside them, who's constantly code-switching, who's constantly never enough, just to let them know that they're not alone. So those are the steps of my intended reader. So there's a series of unfolding yeah. readers that brought this book. The story with your father is the immediate catalyst. Yeah. And the book is replete with a, a wide array of stories of different family members, of different experiences that are told, as I say, both poignantly and poetically, and you know, with joy, sometimes with sorrow. Okay, so thanks for sharing that with them. I, I learned it, that it was at Columbia, uh, speaking with your colleague, Professor oh, yeah, Monica, Monica Miller, Miller. yesterday at uh, Barnard College, and uh, I learned a new word there. She said, uh, you know, my father and his friends were my diasporic resources. <laughs> oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, and, so I had my notebook up, and it was just like being in school. Yeah. You know? so, good, yeah. so I'm yeah. being educated. Well, 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 yeah, I'll tell your dad, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we'll get him on the yeah. phone. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Throughout the book, we hear a lot of information about members of your family, especially your dad, his siblings and others, your mother, your grandmother, and about other important people in your life. But what particularly caught my attention is that you begin the book with a detailed description of your paternal grandfather, who you mentioned when you started to talk earlier, Solomon Warren Robinson, known as Silas, whom you met for the first time, I think, when you were only five years old. Okay. You tell us he was a waiter on the Pullman train between New York and Philadelphia. He's on the very first page of the book, and then he's on the very final page of the book before you get to the, uh, the epilogue and talk about your daughter. Okay. It, ends with, it begins with details of your grandfather shining his shoes and the pride he took in his shine shoes, and it ends on both occasions you celebrate, you use this as a symbol of his pride. Why did you begin in that way? Why did you end in that way? Because I know my grandfather more by, you know, not a lot of stories were really told about him. There were far more stories told in my family about my grandmother because she was a much more conflicted yeah. character in our family lore. She caused more pain. And she also, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, they had, you know, her children admired her, but at, at the same time, she caused them a lot of pain, you know. Um, 
but not a lot of stories were told about the, the diligent labor that the only thing he did in life was go to work and make sure that they that his kids had something to eat and that they had clothing. Get a good job and put food on the table. Exactly. That's your way to write. So the the you know, seeing all the pictures of my grandfather, he was a very dapper man. And I understand that now much more than I did at the outset of writing the book. I understand what respectability meant. What I can begin to grasp what respectability meant to him. It was a recipe for survival. It was also, just like I was saying, it was also a message that here I am in dignity, you know, in fine clothing, looking respectable. You know, because he had control of those parts of life in a racist, somebody, segregated America. He was born in, you know, in, gym, in the Jim Crow South, where you weren't even guaranteed a pair of shoes. No less, you weren't guaranteed an education. He only had three years of schooling. Um, and so to me, my own kind of, I would call it in my case, a part of it is vanity, but I also carry that feeling of respectability. Okay. Uh, so it, it centers around his shine shoes and it ends on the term of me nodding a, an old time from the 1940s and putting his coat on and leaving, you know. Okay. Uh, so there's something about the, this, I mean a lot of things happen while writing the book, but it, discovering what legacy you know what yeah. what how my heritage looks what shape it has you know in me and that respectability is one of those okay good well the he's a very important person in the book but the other important person who appears far more often is the second person you spoke about earlier today yeah. which is your father mm -hmm. and throughout the entire book the book is a conversation it struck me both explicitly and implicitly with your father, with his different values, with his expectations for you, and also with what I would say is a constant conversation where you describe tensions, even antagonism, between you and your father, major and minor that existed, along with your respect, along with your admiration, which required you to hold your tongue on some occasions, and less so on others, and you communicate a lot of that to the reader. I was going to ask you a question about that, but I think I've made that clear. If we have time, I'll come back to that. Because mm -hmm. I want to talk about the other person. When I got to the US in 1984 and I asked people, what are the things to say and not say to keep out of trouble? <laughs> and one of the things they said, there are many. Yes. And one of the things they said was, whatever you do, don't say anything bad about your mother. Okay. Now, I'm not saying you're saying things bad about your mother no, no, in the book, yeah, no, but not. one of the fascinating stuff, not your mother, your grandmother, no, grandmother your grandmother yeah, is yeah. the one, I beg your pardon, not your mother. Well, one of the fascinating, unexpected stories in the, in the book is, correct me if I'm wrong, your grandmother one day abducts her four children, you use the word abduct, and sends them to Nigeria. And your father grows up in Nigeria and eventually finds his way, and your grandfather doesn't know where they are. It takes him years and years until somebody reports him. So tell us about that story, and tell us something briefly about the character of your mother, to, your to, grandmother, to rather. To me, it was, it was even at the outset, and as I realized that I was going to write a book about my family, there was something very uh, paradoxical about my grandfather and my grandmother both of these people living in old black and white photos and some color photos, but in old photographs and in memory. So, and in stories being told in my, in my family. But these vastly different ways of carrying their skin color and uh, their vastly different and, and kind of colliding recipes for survival. You know, there's a, there's a part that I say in the, uh, in the uh, stage performance was, uh, Grandmother was only 14 when she had dad. Four years and a baby girl later, she left grandfather. He never understood her dream about getting an education or that they both should move back to the motherland, Africa. While grandfather put lye in his hair, grandmother wore hers naturally. He called her crazy. She called him ignorant. He said he was a Negro. She said she was black and proud 
And he was destined to just be another nigga America didn't give a damn about. You know, and, and it's just two conflicting ways of trying to survive, you know. For her, sending her four children to Nigeria was what she could do to save them from the streets that she thought would eat them. To save their lives, to save their minds? To save their, to save their physical lives, mm -hmm. but also their minds. And what, so she sends them there in 1951, which is a very kind of, uh, well, it's a radical decision, mm -hmm. and especially as a mother, because mm -hmm. she stayed in, in New York. And in 51, Nigeria is not independent? It's not, not British. independent. Yeah. What's interesting, though, is, you know, when looking at it, I've, I've, you know, my grandfather was a clear migrant who migrated from the fields of the south to, to the industrialized north. My father was a migrant migrating from Harlem to Sweden, you know, and I've always been trying to migrate back across the Atlantic. But my grandmother really had an impact on her future lineage because her sending her children there to West Africa did something with them, you know, and it did something with them, and I think it has to do with their self-awareness of, of blackness and how blackness is carried in, in you know, when you're, when blackness is ubiquitous, mm -hmm. and when pride and roots sure. of culture are vastly different than they are in the African American. Sure. So they never really could go back, even though you know they traveled back from Nigeria. And I think that seed of having seen something else was that was what opened my father's mind <clears throat> for him to be able to gather his courage sure. and go to Sweden. I, I don't think I don't think he would have left Harlem. I mean, I've met his friends, you know, the, the surviving friends that are. He meets the one guy on the street he hasn't seen yeah. in decades. Yeah, yeah, and it's a totally different trajectory, you know. Sure. And. So he could never really entirely go back to Harlem after having seen what he yeah. saw he in refused. Nigeria. He refused to go back. You took him back eventually. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But he didn't want to go. He didn't want you to go. Yeah. yeah. But eventually you went, and I think he was grateful. He was. Or at least reflected. And I've been trying to get him back for eight years, and now finally I, I have an airline ticket for him. So he's okay. coming in, in two weeks to, to, to New York. To and New York. am I correct that of your father and his siblings, three boys and a girl, the three boys returned to the US. Two boys, two girls. Yeah. Okay, but one of the girls remains in yeah, Nigeria right. and becomes head of police yeah. in yeah. Abuja. Yeah. That's right. And is she still alive? She passed no longer alive, summer. but she stayed there and didn't pretend. But she was a big woman in Abuja. Yeah. Okay. And definitely. And yeah. so she stayed the duration of her life. Uh, my one uncle, who's also in the book, he stays for 18 years because uh, they had different fathers. But okay. my my dad's father, so my, Silas manages yeah. to get my father and uh, one of my aunts yeah. back after 10 years. Okay, okay, good. So, so, the, so to me, there was just really, there was something very, very interesting to, to kind of investigate about the differences between grandfather and grandmother, because I see I have a little bit of both. Sure. I can be very outspoken, but then I can also be very kind of clean cut and, and respectful. Okay, which brings me to my next question, which is vulnerable. Yeah. So one of the things that comes across in the book, which may not come across here, is that you reveal and describe a lot of uh, anxieties, considerations, maybe anxiety is a bit strong, but vulnerabilities. And over and over again, you don't hesitate to tell us that you have tears in your eyes, tears of joy, tears of sorrow, and sometimes you just burst out into tears. So it seems to me that one of your goals is that the book is not just a uncritical self-glorification of you. It's designed to show that you have vulnerabilities, that some of the vulnerabilities arise from ways that I would describe of dealing with masculinity and with your father's expectations of what a person is supposed to do. I was going to ask you a question about that. We don't really have time, but I wanted to communicate to the audience. The final question I'll ask you and then I'll turn it over is, it's very clear in the book that there is very substantial influence of black America on you personally, politically, consciously, what I call the influence of African American diasporic resources. Yeah. And that comes through over and over again. But what I'm curious about is, was there any influence from, for example, reggae music or Caribbean? You mentioned a couple of Caribbean. What about Brazil? Did you come across anything around Africa? Did that come into your life in any way, or does it play any role? Late, I mean, 
early in my teenage years, I discovered hip hop. And that discovery was really a huge leap for me in kind of embracing my black heritage. Because all of a sudden, my black heritage became a resource, you know. Uh, and a source of respect, of self-respect. Yeah, in the face you know, of I had a dad from Harlem, like, you know. Original. See, you know what I mean? Yeah, so all of a sudden, that was something to be proud of. Whereas before, I had been ashamed of my father when he came to parent-teacher school meetings and stuff like that because he spoke broken Swedish. He often got angry about things. He was very kind of like non-normative. Yeah. <laughs> this is a good phrase to use yeah, in academic yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Another good one is epistemology. Yeah, yeah. We'll get back to that later. <laughs> <laughs> See, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. um, so non-normative. Yeah, yeah. Non-Swedish normative. Non -Swedish Physically normative. and culturally. Yeah, very culturally non-Swedish. Very confrontational. Yeah. Which is very... Kind and he knew it. It's and he was happy to be it. He used it as a way for him to survive in Sweden. You know. Uh, because it confront, it, being confrontational in Swedish society is something that's very intimidating to Swedes, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> we all know, you know, we all know. Um, uh, but getting back to your question, so hip hop was an early point of, a uh, 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 point of entry sure. into that identity. And, I and mean, it brought you to literature. I dove in wholeheartedly. The literature kind of came yeah, with that, you know. Yeah, um, and then Bobby Seal and Angela Davis, you read these, absolutely. yeah, Malcolm X. I was reading books that, you know, Malcolm X's autobiography, I actually feel like I, to this day, could grasp at that, at that age. When I was reading, like, Baldwin when I was 16, it was, you know, it, to me, it was like, this is a little boring, but he's supposed to be so deep, and this is such a profound book. Where's the message? I can't, you know, get it. But yeah. so some of the books I was too young to really comprehend. Uh, but Malcolm X, mm -hmm. it's very comprehensive. It, it's somebody yeah. who's very easy to yeah, comprehend. Yeah, direct and clear. What an amazing framing of his messaging that he always used. Um, and that was, you know, went in tandem with hip hop culture. Now, a lot of my friends, uh, I would gravitate towards other uh, brown and black kids. Sure. And a lot of them were, you know, very few of them were actually African American. Yeah. Most of them had, you know, dads or moms from like Ghana or Nigeria or Eritrea or Somalia or Trinidad or, you know, Martinique. Sure. Uh, some, you know, Paul, who I write about in the book, his dad is from Jamaica. Right. They all liked reggae because reggae had the same kind of port of entry effect on them, yeah, for me too. but it more, it, 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 it was more, <clears throat> it was more diasporic, whereas hip hop was more endemically an American sure. kind of uh, expression. Well, I hear reggae in some of your music. Absolutely. I hear reggae I've done a lot of reggae. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I see that. Yeah. I'm a part of a reggae band. And, okay. You know, so I've done a lot of that. And then later in life, of course, you know, West African music. Sure. And, did you listen to Fela Kuti? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. International Teeth Teeth. Yes. <laughs> okay, let's, yeah. can I stop you there and we open up yeah, to the yeah, audience, yeah. I'm sure there. So, would you like to take several questions yeah, at a time? Many, one, I may put at one time or take or answer I'm each not question. I'm not going to hurt you, though. Well, we have, so, yeah, I have you a lot of time. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, I can go, you guys can stay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. It's still a free know. country, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> For a while longer, yeah. yeah apparently. <laughs> 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 Let me end by saying this. I'd like to thank the audience for coming today. People who visit this campus often know that there's a wide plethora of activities, events, groups and individuals from all walks of life around the planet that visit and share their insights with us. So I know for a fact that all of you have many, many choices on how to spend your time. And therefore, on behalf of Jason, his manager, staff and colleagues at UC Berkeley, and our colleagues at the consulate, the Swedish consulate in San Francisco, I take the opportunity to thank you for choosing to attend Jason's presentation, to learn about his life, and to hear about his experiences. I urge each and every one of you present to buy a copy of the book with cash money, if you can, please, to enjoy its stories and to share, I quote, in the universe of memories, dreams, plans, sorrows, desires, and convictions 
that Jason has so generously shared with us, I can assure you, you will not regret it. And I urge everyone to think about writing their own stories. Thank you.